Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, good afternoon, David. How you doing, man? Oh, getting along one week closer to the next hockey season. Summer's rolling along. Well, we do have the uh, Halenka tournament, the best under 18 players in the world, the, the players who are, in theory, going to be the top picks in the next uh, entry draft. So I'm actually going to be out of town then, but I, you're going to be in town and you might be yep. covering some of that, right? I'm hoping to get down to the Halenka and do some uh, coverage. It's a little bit um, uh, nebulous in the sense that these are guys you know, that aren't drafted yet, won't be drafted for another 10 months. And they'll be the stars of the World Junior in 2020. Uh, actually, 2021 World Junior, the one that uh, uh, where they'll be 19 years old and they'll be the old fellows in that tournament. So this is kind of the one of the early steps along that path. So. Bruce, let's talk about uh, two things because um, all week long is part of my relentless campaign to post about Milan Lucic. I've been posting about Milan Lucic. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been kind of on kind of a journey in terms of where I'm at with this player because mm -hmm. about halfway through last year when he was failing with McDavid, uh, failing on McDavid's line and not doing well, I, I started to write like, it's best if we orient ourselves and see this guy as a third line hockey player. That's where you can help the team. Mm -hmm. And if, if that's how the coaches see him, he sees himself and the fans especially see him as that even if he's making six million per that's that's probably the happiest outcome for us all because i think he can do a good job as a third line player but i, I at that point i wasn't convinced he was a top uh two line player anymore since then there's been all this talk about um him be possibly being traded then uh you know how it, we got to trade this guy some people frank saravalli of tsn saying the order's got to trade this guy the Oilers kind of coming back, Lucic coming back, with, or Lucic's agent coming back with, he will be back on the Oilers next year. And Bob Stauffer, the Oilers saying, he's going to be playing on the second line with Leon Dreisaitl and on the top power play unit. And I, I was thinking about that kind of stylistically, how that might work. Mm -hmm. That you'd have Dreisaitl and Lucic, kind of this big puck protecting, puck protecting center with a couple big wingers, maybe like Lucic out there and Puglia Yarvi in that line might work. So that's that's been in my head, and and this week I one of the things I did, Bruce, was look at similar players to Lucic, who's kind of a unique player. Yes. And so players like Rick Tockett, at kind of the high, very high end of that kind of player, uh, who's similar at all to Lucic, and at the bottom end, a player like Chris Nyland, who who probably was mostly a fourth line player, but now and then could play on the third line. So that would be the low end. And I wanted to look at those players between the ages of 28 and 30, 34, which is the run of Lucic's contract, to see how they did at that age and um, to see if they kind of had up and down years, to see if it's capable of this kind of player typically will go up and down at that age and bounce back a bit. And, and I was really happy to see that almost every one of them, um, Rick Tockett, Gary Roberts, Pat Verbeek, uh, Chris Nyland, all these guys actually had years where they went down considerably, Scott Mellonby, in terms of their performance, but then would, in fact, bounce back and be a better player after that. And so that was, again, encouraging me that maybe Lucic is going to be bounced back and maybe he could be a second-line player with Leon Dreisaitl and yes, Pulley RV. Um, it just seemed to to make sense that that could happen and that could work because my, you know, my, the other part of my theory was that him playing with McDavid and Nugent Hopkins wasn't working because they were too fast for him. He couldn't keep up anymore. So maybe get him in a different kind of situation and that would work. So th that's where I was until my most recent post. And I just want to, before I get into what I found, I just wanted to know where you have been through this entire thing with Lucic and what you've been thinking the last month in terms of his future role on the team yourself. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, reasonably confident he's going to bounce back in that you know last year he fell off a cliff from about january to april uh there's some broadly unspecified but undercurrents of things going on in his personal life that might have had some impact on the player uh i know i mean what he gets one goal and six assists in the second half of the season after christmas like just terrible so i mean he had 34 points on the year but that was basically the first part of the year scoring at a 50-point rate and the second part of the year scoring at a 10-point rate. I mean, he just completely 
collapse. Now, he's not a 10-point player. Uh, I don't think he's a 34-point player. I certainly anticipate he'll be back at somewhere in the 40s, um, just as sort of the usual, you know, boom-bust echo. Uh, no, I mean, there, there's an opposing school of thought that he just suddenly hit the wall and this is the end and we've got five years of misery ahead of us and all is woe. And so, I, I mean, <laughs> I, actually, I enjoyed your, your comparison of like players and – Given that there are era effects, you know, I mean, guys like Rick Tockett scored a lot more points just because of when they played. But you're comparing them against themselves over their different ages of their career. That's that's legit. And I mean, sure, there's a couple of wacky situations where there was a lockout and somebody had a had a good short short season that maybe was a bit of an anomaly. But you're not going to avoid anomalies in studies of that and that side. So it's. Um, fairly encouraging, as you say, that uh, uh, a number of the guys that you looked at did have bounce back seasons and, and uh, that supported my uh, expectation. I think you can call it an expectation that he'll uh, he'll be better this year than he was uh, certainly the second half of last year. What, what we see, Bruce, when we look, dig into some other numbers on Lucic between his uh, 36 games where he wasn't slumping, where he got 26 points, Mm-hmm. And then the 46 games when he had the one goal and I think six or seven assists and he wasn't right. a slump is that his shot rates were almost the same. His, his hit rates were almost the same. So mm-hmm. to me, like there, there had been some talk from, from Stauffer and others about, you know, that, that maybe that the hustle hadn't been there in the second half and he had kind of given up. But I think that the hit that, you know, the, that's not what I saw with Lucic. I saw him getting increasingly frustrated, but the hit rates indicate like he, his hits actually went up from three a game um, early in the year when he was scoring points to 3.2 a game late in the year when he wasn't scoring points. So he was still out there hitting people and trying hard. He just wasn't having any success. So some of it, I think, uh, in terms of the, the goal scoring itself was bad puck luck. He just got a little luckier earlier on. And the other the other part was, um, I think he did lose his confidence. So he's still getting the chances in tight, but he's he's not making the most of them because he's just slamming it at the net, like he's slamming it at the goalie. And so some of the slamming at the goalie not going in is bad luck, but but also he's not maybe taking the time to make as good a play as he might have. So that's what I really think went on with him um, between the first and the second half. But Bruce, I want to get back to, so my working theory was, has been this week, yeah, maybe he can play with dry settle. And then I looked at natural stat trick numbers. And it's a great site because it, um, it used to get these numbers off hockey analysis, but now natural mm-hmm. stat trick is the play to, place to go. The best of course, place is... Of course it has them too, but yeah, those are great types of numbers to be able to access, aren't they? So what you can do is look at how a player does with and without another player. And what I found was with Dreisaitl and, and, Maru, and Lucic, they got terrible results. Two years running together, Bruce. Mm-hmm. So I had in mind, like, based on a, a very, very small sample size during the 2017 playoffs when Dreisaitl, Lucic, and Slapishev played well together, that that might work. Maybe that would have. But just overall, Dreisaitl and Lucic, when they're on the same line together, that line gets crushed in terms of goals for and against. They're, they're like at 30 to 35% goals for percentage. So, you know, so out of 10 goals, they'll score, they'll have three, four, and seven against. and. Yeah. And that's that's horrible. It's yeah. just horrible. And so there's no indication at all. Lucic does much better with RNH. He does much better with McDavid, as a matter of fact. So, well, you might conclude from that then if you're, you know, a, in the pro Leech Lucic camp, like the Oilers camp, that oh, you gotta play him then with McDavid or 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 Eugene Hopkins. But here's the sad fact is when you look at McDavid's numbers last year with and without, when he was with a big forward like uh, Maroon, Dreisaitl, or Lucic, he had about a 50% goals for rate, goals for percentage. So McDavid, the Oilers sawed it off. They had as, about as many goals for as goals against when McDavid was on the ice with these with these big guys, Lucic, Maroon and Dreisaitl. That's not nearly good enough when Connor McDavid's on the ice. You have got, the Oilers have got to outscore the opposition when he's on the ice. And guess what? When he was on the ice with faster players and often smaller players, but sometimes cagier players, he did, McDavid did much better. He was more at, closer to, to a 58, 
uh, 60% goals for percentage. So the Oilers as a team were just were, were thriving when McDavid was out there with players like Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Ty Ratty, Yessi Pugliarvi. I mean, the narrative on Pugliarvi, John Shannon and Oilers now said he was scared witless to play with McDavid. But he had, he had, even though he was apparently scared witless, they had like a 59% goals for percentage when Pulley, Arvey, and McDavid were on the ice. You know, they, they scored uh, 13 and they let in nine. So this is, again, it's a small sample size, so you can only, only make so much of it. Goals are kind of a rare event, so you can only put yeah. so much weight in all of this stuff. Nonetheless, uh, it's very, the overall numbers... McDavid's entire season is a very large sample size. It's a full season sample size. And um, I, it just clearly indicates you got to play McDavid with fast, skilled, really smart players. So you're looking at Nugent Hopkins, Raddy, Yamamoto, Pulley, RV, Pontus, Aberg. You're not looking at, at Dreisaitl and um, Lucic. And Bruce, even in 2016-17, when McDavid and Dreisaitl had some success together, real success together on a line, McDavid did better. The Oilers did better when it wasn't McDavid with Drysaddle, when it was McDavid with other combinations of players. So I think it's safe to say, like there's this notion out there, well, if the Oilers want to make the playoffs, I heard this many times last year, they got to play McDavid and Drysaddle. They can drive the team to the playoffs and then maybe you'll split them up in the playoffs. That's just not borne out by the numbers two years running. And I'm left with this, Bruce. When it comes to Lucic, the wrong question is, what can we do to get Milan Lucic's game going? That is the wrong question. He, the right question is, what can we do to get Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, and Jesse Pugliarvi going? That has got to be the entire focus. And Lucic, a player who had every opportunity now, two years running, every opportunity last year and didn't make the most of it, his question is, what can I do to fit on this team, period? How can I fit in? And the Oilers, they shouldn't be given much of a thought to him otherwise, I don't think. Their focus needs to be on Pugliarvi, on McDavid, on Dreisaitl and Nugent Hopkins, not on, on Milan Lucic. And certainly the idea that, that the Oilers should go into the season with him penciled in on the second line is a, is a bad idea. It's the wrong focus for the team, and I'm, I'm a little bit worried about it. Yeah, well, for sure the goals for stats are, are the pits, and they have been for two years running, as you say. Uh, as you also say, it is a, a, a small number statistic in that it's a rare event, uh, actual goal. Uh, they're shot shares, and I know you're not a, a huge proponent of this, uh, and you, you'll have scoring chance numbers. For, do you have scoring chance numbers together of them when they're on the same line? That, that's in a perfect world, I guess we'd have we'd have all of that. Uh, anyway, they the last two years, they were well over 50% together, just the two of them, uh, Lucic and Dreisaitl, for uh, Corsi, Fenwick, shots on goal. And each case, the percentages were just terrible. Their PDO this past year was 933. They were, they were shooting, the Oilers were shooting 7% when Dreisaitl and uh, Lucic were on the ice together, and the opponents were shooting 14%. Well, if you're going to make, you're going to give up, uh, you know, a, double the shot rate. It doesn't matter what you're doing, how many shots you're getting. If the other teams are scoring, uh, converting twice as often on the shots they do get, that's a losing proposition. And even in 2016, 17, same thing. They were running around uh, over 50% in all of the underlying shot, uh, shot attempt metrics. And they were a terrible PDO of uh, nine. Th let me get the right one here. Yeah, they were they were just nine sixty four, six percent shooting four, ten percent for the other guy. So again, now whether that's a weakness of theirs defensively, I do know an on ice conversion rate of seven or six percent is not good enough offensively. They need to be finishing more plays, and that's on them. What's happening at the other end of the ice is a little more uh, harder to establish. What was going wrong there? Yes, although Drysaddle would have a lot to do with that as a center. That's a key defensive position. But if your no, goalie, it's, it's, if your goalie's got an eight sixty three save percentage, yeah. so so Corsi is rel when we start to look at groups of players, uh, mm -hmm. how groups of players perform. Corsi and Fenwick become more more relevant than they mm -hmm. certainly for an individual player. When I think they're actually right. misleading yes. and irrelevant, but for groups of players, they start to become more relevant. Now, when we start to see those trends over a couple of years where they have uh, um, these two years in a row, yep. 
that's a little weird though. You know, maybe, maybe we have a, a couple of players who can kind of keep the puck to the outside in the offensive zone, but really are not very good at, at generating the best scoring chances uh, and um, cashing in on them together. Like two years running, then you start to yeah, wonder about true, that man. maybe. Um, but you know, that's, so that's a countervailing that information though. And it's, it's fair enough for us. Maybe there, maybe there's something there. I mean, they did look good together in the 2017 playoffs, but I'm just, I'm not, it just, it's not enough to persuade me that this should be the plan going into the season. Again, with Lucci's res results, essentially Bruce, he had one good streak last year when he was with McDavid and Puglia Yarvi just before, after McClellan finally broke up McDavid and Dreisaitl yeah. in late November. And he went with the three centers, RNH, McDavid and Dreisaitl on their own lines. Starting in the Boston game. Yeah, I remember that. They won that game. And they and went on about a nine and four run thereafter. It was the best, best uh, right up through Christmas. And then after that, a cliff. So Lucic had 12 points in 13 games. He, and he was playing That's great two-way hockey was. with McDavid. He yeah, he played well. And, and so that might be an argument. Well, put him with McDavid and Puglia RV or McDavid and RNH. You know, he had really good results and he had great scoring. I did do the scoring chance numbers for that period of time with Lucic mm -hmm. and they were out of this world good. Mm -hmm. So he really did have his best. Right work but the rest of the year before that and after that he was not good with rnh before that that was the center before that he was those two weren't didn't do well together in terms of their their they were leaking uh major chances against right left and center nugent hopkins especially in the middle was struggling and then after that mcdavid and dry subtle, excuse me mcdavid and lucic were together quite a bit though after that streak and without Lucic's Puglia game Arby. without pulley rv and they fell apart like they, they, Lucic did not do well with McDavid after that. So I'm not like if, if McClellan decides to put Lucic with McDavid and RNH and Pulley RV again, I, like I'm not going to lose my mind. I think that experiment might be worth trying because they did have some success for a whole month with that line. Um, but again, I don't think the focus is at all at this point has got to be what can we do to get Milan Lucic going? Like, yeah, he's really got to think about how can I get Jesse Pulley RV going? How can I get Connor McDavid, Ryan Nugent Hopkins? And and frankly, Bruce, it took him so long to th th McClellan so long to get in that mindset. Like, how can I get RNH going? That it took him two, three years with uh, RNH and McDavid on the same team to put them on the same line regularly. The coaches yeah. had the wrong focus, and this this is my concern in this whole thing is that I think McClellan starts to, he 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 can get a love for a veteran player like Latestu, like Korpakoski, uh like Lucic and overplay that player it's in a key good. position continually and and it starts to make the fans crazy it starts to turn the fans against the player that's what happened with Lucic last year because he was playing McClellan was playing him with McDavid endlessly even though it wasn't working so I'm worried coming into this year that McClellan's going to have that sweet tooth for Lucic and continue to put him in spots where he's not uh, able to perform well yeah they, i mean they do have to find a spot for him but you're, you're right that can't be the focus they have to they have to focus on where is the best spots and combinations for their focal point players uh which is mcdavid obviously number one dry subtle obviously number two uh and i i agree with the different lines approach for those two uh lucic to me, he's looking like a middle six player. I can possibly see him working out with Dreisaitl, but, I mean, those percentages, uh, they kind of scream they shouldn't sustain. If they can keep the shots coming, that they should do better. But, geez, when you're paying two guys $14.5 million, that line's got to be an outscorer. Breaking even isn't cutting it either, let alone 35 or 40%. You know, you, you've got to be scoring 55% when you when you – when you have that much of your cap resources buried into into that line, I mean, same thing with the first line with uh, Nugent Hopkins and McDavid. Whoever you put on the right wing, it's a twenty million dollar touch near near enough. They got to be outscores. Got to be. You can't just break even. Just doesn't cut it. So so it looks like there's some statistical evidence um, for maybe trying Lucic with McDavid. Uh, and and pull or or rnh and maybe trying lucic with dry saddle hope hoping that you know their bad luck ends you know two year run of bad luck ends and so so i think it's we shouldn't lose our minds i shouldn't lose my mind if the coach tries those things 
But I think after, if we see that it goes more than like, what, five games, um, and we're seeing more of the same, it's not working, then, then and it's, that's just not a five game sample size of it not working. That's like added on to what we've already seen it not working. And the coach has got to move away from it at that point. Like it, it might be a brief experiment, but it, it, if it's not working, make it brief, man. Because we've seen that we've seen this movie. It's a bad movie. We'd like to see a good movie. Yeah, well, let's wait until February just to be sure, right, David? Not like we did last year. Like I, I have to say that my problems with the uh, the coaching staff in 2017, player deployment was right at the top of the list. I just couldn't understand a some of the decisions and b some of the some of the stubbornness to stick with combos that really weren't working. And it was like there was, there wasn't enough ideas churning in the coaches room. And this is where I think having a new mix of coaches is going to really be a, um, a positive step. I hope so, Bruce. And I hope, I really hope that the focus is on getting some of these young wingers, uh, especially Pulley RV, I think who's, who is ready to pop as they, uh, I, I think, you know, showed every, yeah sign last year when he first came up that he was ready to go i think kyler yamamoto may be ready to go i mean he's the same age as eberly when eberly came up and and had a pretty decent season as a rookie so uh and the same very similar skill set as jordan eberly so um you know pontus aberg has got a lot of skill i i want to see the focus being on getting these players uh the opportunity because i think that that, that based on the, the 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 way the nhl is going um the way McDavid and Dreisaitl play, um, they can use them fast, skilled wingers, and so let's uh, let's see if uh, we'll we'll see those line combinations early on. So, Bruce uh, Darnell Nurse is the other thing we're going to talk about today. Okay. His agent Anton Thun or Tun T H U N had some interesting things to say to Jim Matheson of the Journal, essentially that Nurse is looking for a short term deal because the Oilers lack the cap space to sign. Um, Nurse to a long-term deal, and Tun Thun set seemed to be suggesting that that five million a year wasn't going to be enough to sign. If I'm reading this correctly, wasn't going to be enough to sign Nurse long-term. Is is that how you read it, and what did you make of it? Well, here's a direct quote from Maddie's article: If they've got five million in cap space, it's not going to be a long-term deal. That sounds pretty cut and dried. Now you could. You could parse what does five million in cap space mean when you figure they're going to have to sign one other player, and that they're going to need to leave a little bit of, uh, of room for uh, injuries and you know in-season adjustments. Um, so it may be they've got five million in cap space, but they've only said to the player, "We can only offer you four million over. We're going to give you the Adam Larson and Oscar Kleffbaum deal, but that's as high as they can go." And if the players can't say, "No, we'd rather prove ourselves." For one to two more years and go for the big fly and that's that's how i'm reading this article and, and maddie's saying more agents are are thinking of this way going for the big pk suban you remember what happened there where uh montreal didn't want to go long term and he did sign a bridge deal and then after the two years when he won the norris trophy uh then all of a sudden he was nine million dollars and the most expensive defenseman in the league so I think it's a good strategy for Nurse, honestly. Like if he want, if he's he's thinking, okay, I, he's confident he's gonna he's gonna be in the NHL for the next eight years, let's say, mm -hmm. and he thinks, how can I make the most money in that time period? Right. If he if he signed, let's say, I think the Oilers should only reasonably offer him a Larson Clefbaum contract. So they both signed three or four years ago uh, uh, for about four point one six seven per million per year. The cap has gone up what 10 percent since then yeah, so like that's 4.5 in today's yeah 4.5 4. 4. so if the orders were to offer nurse 4.7 uh 4.8 i wouldn't even i think that would be reasonable over like a seven eight year deal I, I i i think that would be nice to see i would like to see that but if the agent is looking for five plus million a year uh over that same time period he's i think he's looking for an overpay mm -hmm. and and at this point from the oilers so if he wants to get that huge amount of bigger, larger amount of money over time, he's they're going to have to play it. And you know, if the Oilers make hay in the playoffs, and Nurse has a great playoff run, Bruce, mm -hmm. he could he could dry sidle them, right? Like he could yeah. get that. Oh, yeah. Let's say let's say the Oilers could sue ban them. Yeah, let's say the Oilers 
won a few rounds or even got to the Stanley Cup final in, in Nurse's contract year. Mm -hmm. And he was playing in the top four or even got on a hot run in the playoffs and was in the top pairing, which is not uh, not impossible. He's a really good player, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could be looking at a lot more than $5 million a year for Darnell Nurse under the right circumstances. And those that, that could come about if he keeps – his trajectory has been to gradually improve every single year. That's yes. what I've seen from Darnell Nurse. If he continues to do that, and it's not, he could. I think that it could possibly continue for another couple of years. Then you might be looking at a player who's worth six or six and a half or seven million dollars a year. If he got like forty-five points one year and did really well in the playoffs, um, yeah, he could cash in big time. I'd be very surprised to see him get forty-five points just based on the style of player that he is. Um, but uh, uh, one question I have for you is: Let's assume they do go the bridge deal, what is the appropriate um, cap hit for, say, a two-year bridge? Well, I think it should be, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan, so the fans want them to get paid less. Yes. So I'm going to say around $3.1 million, but I, I suspect <laughs> he gets about per year, but I suspect he gets um, about um, $3.5 million or $3.4 million would be my bet, Bruce. And you yeah, know what? I, you're right about the 45 points a year. I was just kind of throwing that out yeah, there. No, I understand. That, that would I be pretty, that's gonna, that's that would be pretty, keep him down. That that's, would be pretty high. and He'd have to get on the power play to do that. That's, that's is, it, is, is it impossible he'll get on the power play? I mean, it's not likely, but it is possible. And that, so, so a lot would have to go right. He would have to improve enough and be enough better than anyone else that he would get regular power play time. That's the only way he gets to 45 points. And and that's, I agree, that's not that likely. So I just don't see him as that creative of, of an offensive player. And that's where the big, big money is for defensemen or the guys that can also put points on the board. And sometimes it's unfair, like a, a better um, all round defenseman, uh, you know, might actually help your team more. But it's the guys with the big points that mostly get the, get the big bucks. And in the case of, uh, nurse uh you mean last year with the power play struggling as mightily as it did they still didn't really see him as much of a power play option it was just i, I just don't see him with the with the offensive imagination uh you know he'll rush the puck into the zone but he's only got like two moves that he'll use right why yeah, he's a... why he'll always take it he'll always make his one-on-one -on -one move out towards the boards and he'll either shoot from there or he'll go around the net and try and jam it in on the far side and every goalie in the league knows it's coming so it doesn't work and i mean he, he did get 26 points was actually pretty decent for him last year you know hats off uh, a few cheap second assists but that's part of the that's part of the position uh and he, he really went on one tear there in January. Remember when they got the winning goal in Vegas and then he had like four goals on a road trip or something. It was just crazy. Just everything was suddenly going in for him. But that fell off uh, pretty mightily after the uh, after the All-Star break. So I had him in a recent post. I had him for $3.2 million as a, you know, assuming a two-year bridge. So I was very close to your figure. And while I was writing, I was saying, yeah, I'd probably be 3.5 when the when – the, when the shoe drops, and I got taken to a task by a reader who said, "You're dreaming if it's anything under 4.5 for a bridge." And I'm going on a bridge contract. You're going to pay that guy more than you pay Larson and and Clefbaum, um, who are you know getting paid well into the UFA years. I just don't see it. But uh, there's there's a range of opinion. Some people think this guy is just the next superstar i guess because i mean honestly i just don't see four and a half million for a bridge no that is not going to be the case uh that that would be more like the long-term deal and yeah you know, that's what i was thinking i said if you're going to pay him that on a bridge why not just sign him for eight years and then my buddy came back and said that'll be six million plus so well no that that would be if you put up <laughs> justin schultz numbers one year like two years ago schultz got 51 points mm -hmm. in uh for pittsburgh and uh, yeah, you know, that would have been nice. Five million. Yeah, that would have been nice to have uh, that guy in your third pairing. But you know, I think so. Uh, I think we're gonna um, nurse is gonna be. I think he's gonna be in the top four this year. Um, it, it'll be him and either Secker or, or Clefbaum, who's ever healthier and more affected out, out of those two. I don't think like it would be nice if Secker and Clefbaum were both as super effective as they were at times and 
2016, 16, 17. I don't think that's going to be the case, though. I think Nurse is rising, but it's going to be hard for him to get a, more than 22, 20, 22 minutes a game because to get that, he's got to play on the power play. And, and I, I think he could get second unit power play time, maybe, if he really mm -hmm. did take another step up. He do, does have a good shot. So, um, but I don't see him ever being a top power play unit guy. Um, that, that it would be, ex, you know, Sheldon Surrey kind of made that leap to the top right. power play, but he developed an absolutely killer slap shot. He had, he had bionic surgery on his wrist. He was, the, he was the original Steve Austin. He had some kind of wrist injury, and I don't know what the surgery was, but he came out of it with a superpower of this bomb of a slap shot. Remember they called him Studley Wonder Bomb? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I, I think, honestly, he had the hardest shot of any oiler in the NHL era. So oh, like, yeah. compare the milk man Alexander, you know, that's the guy who might come close to him for the biggest rocket. But I mean, you have, what about, uh, Bruce, what about Risto? <laughs> what about Risto? Silton oh, Risto, yeah, he kind of crossed over WHA into NHL, didn't he? But yeah, he, go back he a long fire way. that puck. Certainly in most people's memories, I think, uh, um, uh, Surrey would have had the, the, uh, the single hardest shot. That's one thing nurse really doesn't have. He's got a muffin. Uh, of a shot. Uh, Nurse has a good slap shot, Bruce. Well, forget when. But he got off about three or four of them last year. Yeah. But th this is the thing. Surrey, when he was the same age, he, he scored like 10, 12, 11 points a year. And then all of a sudden, no, so, but he's the exception to the rule. Like he's, there's probably, yeah. a, you can kind of one hand defensemen who have started out putting up, you know, one, you know, between 10 and 15 points a year. And then suddenly, developed into power play assassins like there's it's probably a class of about three guys over time so steve, uh, steve smith did it he had i think nine points in his first ahl season and he wound up having 350 point seasons in the nhl so he really grew his game but it's a rare thing for sure yeah so but you know it's i'm just saying it's not impossible in there's because we have seen this incremental improvement every single year he's been a pro hockey player but you know there's a lot of people a lot of really smart hockey observers who question his hockey iq and um i'm not as much in that camp as as they are i think he's he he's he just his assets in terms of his skating um maybe took over at times instead so instead of relying on his mind but i i do see his hockey iq actually improving working with adam oates and uh, i think it has improved i think his his decision making has gotten better so we'll see I, I i'm okay with him on a bridge deal um yeah, i would too. have been happier with him getting a larson cleft bomb deal if he's not willing to take a larson cleft bomb deal and the money's not there and it may not be there for that then then let's see how this goes yeah what we talk about his special teams i want to see him improve on the penalty kill like i think he could be an ace penalty killer but i still think he's prone to getting burned uh in tight to the net and uh, losing positional battles uh, or recognizing the the danger man split second too late, you know. There's thing, and that comes with experience. And as you say, he's under still under 200 games, and so that aspect of his game, I think we have every right to expect it to grow. And it's that growth that will earn him the bigger contract in the longer term. But for now, I think the bridge deal is the way to go. This is also a player Bruce and McClellan likes. I think. I mean, I think. Mm -hmm. The coaches seem to really. The management and coaches have always loved this guy, near as I can tell. Yeah, so he is going to get his chances. He is going to be in the top four next mm -hmm. year, and if you can get a top four defenseman in the NHL, even even in his on his second contract around you know around the league average salary, that's the you know he's not going to be overpaid for for what he gets. Maybe maybe it'll shock us all, and he's going to get like three point eight million, three point seven million. Who knows? Like uh, maybe he'll uh, get four point five. <laughs> And then you'll have to apologize to that guy. Oh, well, that's a given. <laughs> All right, Bruce. Uh, one, so other, we, one, one other item, if I might. Mikko, Kos, Mikko Koskinen. Going to wear a sweater number 19. He's going to be the first NHL goalie to wear a number in the teens since Jack Norris in 1964-65. Wow. And I hear Koskinen. The other thing, he's not going to wear a mask. In that. <laughs> he's tripping yeah. it old school. He's yeah. well. He wore nineteen in the KHL and for Finland and stuff. And I, I, I remember what we talked about this in, or I talked about this in a podcast a while back. And I hope he keeps it just for fun. And today, when they actually announced it, I did some research, and 
Uh, you won't remember this. Uh, not many of our uh, reader or let's listeners and watchers will, but I do. 1964-65 season was the year that they enforced the two goalie system, and they they made teams dress two goalies. Up until then, there was one goalie and another guy in the stands. As the first goalie took puck in the teeth and had to leave the game, they'd have to dress the other guy, and there'd be a big long delay. And they finally said, "Enough of this crap. Let's have a second goalie on the bench ready to go." So the, the backups started wearing numbers like 24. Terry Sawchuk was 24, and Roger Crozier was 22. And there was, you know, strange, strange numbers of these guys playing in uh, uh, other teams. And Jack Norris got number 17, and he was the last goal. In fact, between number one and number 20, I don't recall ever seeing a goalie anywhere in that range. It's either 20, 30 plus typically, or one. And uh, with the one exception, of course, the international hockey, the Czechoslovak system always had their goalies wearing number one and number two. Which and, of course, sense. in the f first year of the Oilers' uh, existence, Jack, Jack Norris. Norris was their starting goalie for the Alberta Oilers, yes, as you will recall. And he played 64 games that, that year, Bruce, and had a 3.06 goals against average. So. He was the guy also, uh, other footnote for Jack Norris's career is that he was involved in the very famous trade of uh, Phil Esposito uh, and uh, Fred oh, Stanfield that's right. and Ken Hodge to Boston. And Jack Norris went the other way. Gilles Marat went the other way. Pitt Martin went the other way. Chicago did get some good players, but uh, Boston absolutely killed it on that trade. It was a turning point in uh in Boston history was when they got rid of Jack Norris. <laughs> massive trade, massive trade. Bruce, well, let's... One of the biggest trades ever, seriously. Yeah. All right, let's leave it there, Bruce. Sounds good. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for watching and listening, everyone. And in the meantime and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.